Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to Creating a Culture of Student Success, Insights from Howard University, uh, presented uh, by Kaplan. And first, let me start by thanking Inside Higher Ed for hosting us here today. Uh, really excited to have all of you join us and looking forward to a great conversation today. Uh, first, please let me introduce uh, my fearless leader, uh, our Vice President for University Partnerships here at Kaplan, uh, Kim Canning. Hi, Kim. Hi, Mark. Um, thanks, everybody, for joining. Uh, I'm really looking forward to our conversation um, and getting to know more about Howard today. Excellent. And with that, uh, the, the star of the show, our special guest, uh, Provost uh, Anthony Wutu from uh, Howard University. Uh, and uh, Dr. Wutu, we were talking a little bit um, before we got started here uh, about uh, Howard University. And uh, I was uh, telling you about my friend who uh, sent his three sons there to Howard. And now two of them are engineers and one of them is currently in med school and uh, how proud uh, all of us down here in New Orleans are, are, are of them. And I think that's just an example of the type of things that go on at Howard uh, on a regular basis. Um, you guys are uh, the leading producer of African-American students entering medical school, uh, the only HBCU to be ranked in the US News and World Reports uh, best colleges list. Uh, and just have an outstanding record of uh, student achievement. So I guess we'll start with what makes Howard this special place and you know what, just maybe brag for a little bit on your institution if you don't mind. So sure, and um, first of all, greetings to, to everyone. Um, Kim and Mark, thank you for that, that wonderful introduction. I'll have to get the recording for our um, communications team to be able to share that with. <laughs> Uh, all of our, our advocates, but but Howard is a, a special place and uh, it, it's a unique institution uh, for a number of reasons, but really primarily I would say um, our people, uh, our faculty who do an outstanding job really preparing um, the future. Um, we have excellent students who, who come here and, and really find a success um, regardless of, of what discipline they, they choose. Uh, to study, we have a, a committed um, staff, but but also our, our alums are just doing fantastic um, things. And um, Howard is just a, a unique institution, in, in part just based on how we were founded, um, where we are um, as an institution, and and the unique role that that we play um, in higher education. We we were founded in 1867. Uh, shortly after the Civil War, and were one of very few institutions were actually chartered by Congress. Um, at the time that we were founded, there, there was no district government. And so the university's charter was actually um, done by um, the US Congress. We're also one of two non-military um, institutions in the country that receives a direct appropriation um, from Congress. And so that, that brings a certain level um, of, of, of attention, it brings a certain level of, of uniqueness. Um, but we also understand that we have a, a commitment uh, to really serve not just the, the DC area, which is where we're based, um, but we see ourselves as a, a national institution that, that is contributing to the fabric of the country, is really training um, leaders that are going to have impact in, in, in various disciplines. Um, nationally and in some cases internationally. Um, so that is something that, that we really um, take as a significant part of, of our mission and the reason why we were created and the reason why um, we have to do successfully the things that we do in preparing students for leadership roles um, for the future. So in our last, I, was, I mentioned to you earlier, in our last webinar, we talked to um, President Williams from Hampton and and some of their initiatives around student first and and you know what they're doing to put the student experience as the most important at the forefront of of what the university is focused on. Um, you know, I, I think in looking at 
your website and, and looking at the strategic plan and, and some of your strategic goals, you know, my team spends a lot of time trying to do research about universities and, and try to identify, um, you know, what priorities are and how we can support that. Could you talk more about Howard Forward? I, I just have been so impressed with um, what that looks like and how you how the school has presented that out um, to the world as what, what the goals are of the school. And then also the immediate impact that it seems to have had, had over you know, a two year time period. It just seems really impressive. Sure, no, no, absolutely. Um, Howard Ford is our current um, strategic plan, uh, which we implemented in, in 2019. And it's over a five year period of time from 2019 to 2024. And as we were conceptualizing the plan and thinking about um, the goals we wanted to, to set as an institution, the impact that we wanted to continue to, to have and, and really being thoughtful um, about that, we, we didn't want to create a strategic plan that would, you know, after months uh, to create would then sit on the shelf and, and, and would really um, not, not be a meaningful part of, of what we were doing. And so we were very intentional in making sure that we were creating goals and, and metrics that we would evaluate um, and that we would make public. And, and so there would be some level of, of accountability. So almost everything that we're doing now, we um, assign to one of the five pillars of, of Howard um, Ford. So if you look at uh, a number of the successes that, that we have had, we've had a um, nearly 40% increase in enrollment since 2019. Um, we've increased our on-time graduation um, rate to, to over 60%, which is um, over a 15% increase over the last um, seven years as well. Our first year student retention um, is over 90% for um, the first time. And we're, we're creating a number of programs that we were intentional that needed to be innovative, um, that needed to be uh, contemporary. And we, we wanted to make sure that they were interdisciplinary. We have um, 14 schools and colleges, including an, an academic health center. Uh, we have a hospital on campus. We have a, a radio station and a television station. But like most other academic institutions, we, we attended to be very siloed and, and, and worked um, really within our academic units. And so part of what we wanted to accomplish with, with Howard Ford was to, to really encourage interdisciplinary collaboration across the institution between our schools and colleges between uh, administrative units as well. And so we're, we're measuring that and, and we're making sure that uh, the investments that we're making institutional re really speak to each of the goals and, and um, metrics that we're evaluating with Howard Ford. Uh, one, one question that I think has come up in the previous web, webinars that we've had is around, I think that interdisciplinary, how, how do you, how do you build coalition? How do you how do you pull people together? Consensus building. Um, do you think that is there is there something in particular that you feel that you the school has done differently that leadership has done differently in order to help create that atmosphere? Um, and then I guess as a follow up, are there certain um, initiatives that you would really point to as maybe this was the first or second initiative that was successful that kind of snowballed into other initiatives that, you know, that continued with Howard Forward? Sure, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll point out um, a couple and, and really speak to the, the broader um, intent, which was really to, to encourage um, one from the, the leadership um, level, encourage our deans, our, um, at a cabinet level um, to be more collaborative and, and interdisciplinary and really build upon supporting uh, that collaboration throughout the institution. So as an example, we um, recently created a Center for Applied Data Science and Analytics, um, and we were intentional uh, not to seed it in one of our existing schools or colleges. We, we actually 
um, formed it out of the office of the provost. Um, and so we have currently faculty all over the university that are engaged in um, data science and data analytics work in our College of Arts and Sciences in our math and statistics um, areas. We have faculty in our College of Engineering and Architecture and Computer Science. We have faculty in the School of Business uh, in our Information Systems program. But we also have faculty doing um, data science research or um, other work in our health professional schools in our School of Social Work. And so we, we intentionally placed the Center for Applied Data Science and Analytics in the office of the provost um, and created a number of programs and initiatives um, really to encourage interdisciplinary collaboration across the institution. Uh, one specific example, we um, uh, started a, a cluster hire initiative. We um, made available and made known to, to our deans that we were going to support the hiring of um, up to seven additional faculty in data science and analytics. And those individuals could be seated in any current school or college, and they would have a joint appointment with um, our center uh, for applied data science and analytics. Uh, the catch was that um, proposals that we received had to be collaborations between at least two schools. And so we've ended up funding, for example, a proposal from our College of Pharmacy and our College of Medicine that have partnered together. Um, we have a, a collaboration between our College of Arts and Sciences and uh, the Graduate School. Um, and so, um, so long as they, you know, they, they met together, they developed a, an, an innovative idea, we would fund um, at least one or more faculty lines within each of those partnering um, collaborations. And it doesn't cost the dean anything. The, 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 the uh, compensation for those faculty come out of the Office of the Provost and funding that we received from uh, the MasterCard Impact Fund. Um, and so out of that, we also are, um, have created and are implementing a master's degree in applied data science and analytics. And again, the thinking was um, we want to create a new cadre of data scientists. Um, they certainly are going to have to have an underlying and a foundational understanding of the technical aspects of data science, um, but we wanted them to, to really focus on the application of data science to address broader societal problems. So how do we use data science to address issues of healthcare disparities? How do we use data science uh, to address criminal justice reform? How do we use um, data science to address um, issues of socioeconomic disparities? So what is really interesting is that as, as we're uh, implementing that master's degree program this fall, the director of the graduate program is not a basic scientist and, and is not a, um, uh, a technologist. She's a, a faculty member in um, our Department of Afro-American Studies, uh, but she's gone on to get um, additional master's degree level data science training from an Ivy League institution. And so her perspective of data science is really not grounded necessarily in the technical aspects, even though she understands that, it really is framed around how do we use data science to address these broader societal problems in a way that is interdisciplinary and collaborative. So how do we incorporate arts and humanities and social sciences faculty and have them partner uh, with faculty who have a background in data science to really think in a creative way of addressing these broader problems. And so that's, I think some of the thinking that was was born out of um, our strategic plan and 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 ways that were were both incentivizing and and creating um, unique ways for for faculty to um, think creatively, uh, think about innovative um, academic programs, and think about how we can um, reconfigure things that we're already doing to be more inclusive and to be more uh, innovative. Uh, another example I would um, provide is um, our CAR STEM Scholars Program. We had started a, a program really mo modeled after the Meyerhoff Program uh, at UMBC, 
And the idea was to, to identify young people who would commit to pursuing PhDs or MD PhDs in, in any STEM field um, that they selected and then really supporting them through their undergraduate studies and, and helping them identify outstanding graduate programs so that they would go on uh, to be um, STEM scientists, new faculty members over the next um, several years and, and generations. So uh, we were fortunate to be able to get um, funding from the Karsh uh, Foundation. And so we're now in our sixth cohort of car scholars. And these are young people who are committing to pursuing PhDs in the biomedical sciences and computer science and engineering and math. And again, any STEM field uh, that we offer. The first cohort um, graduated two years ago. Um, the second cohort graduated last year and we just interviewed uh, for our seventh cohort, but these uh, are really outstanding young people are, are now in, in graduate schools at University of Pennsylvania, at Hopkins, at Stanford, at Georgia Tech, um, and are really doing outstanding things. And so, you know, we think sort of that interdisciplinary collaborative um, spirit that we've tried to, to incentivize as well as Howard's framing around social justice. Uh, we like to say social justice is, is a part of our DNA really creates a, a unique environment for, for our students to um, really be successful, to be collaborative, to think about uh, the contributions that they can make uh, to help address these broader societal issues and really encourage them to think of themselves as leaders, as potential leaders in, in the various fields that they would um, aspire to, uh, to, to being successful in. That's, well, that's really I great. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say maybe you could just talk about the bat. You know, we before we jumped on, we were talking about the basketball and the swimming team. Mm -hmm. Swim team, you know, maybe you could give some props to those students about you know how they're participating and they're going to change the world. No, oh, absolutely. And you know, just before we joined, we were um, talking both about our our swim team that um, really has been getting a, a lot of attention. Well, well deserved. Um, both for their athletic success, but also for just the outstanding young people that they are. Our um, basketball team uh, won our conference championship, the MEAC championship for the first time in 30 years. And so we're um, fortunate to be able to participate in the uh, NCAA tournament in, in March Madness. And it was exciting for the university and we, we certainly were, were very proud of them for their athletic accomplishments. But what isn't necessarily um, as publicly well known is uh, our basketball team had volunteered to, to really adopt um, a woman shelter um, um, before the semester started, have done a number of activities in support of the women at the shelter, have, have done fundraising, have donated uh, items. And, and you don't necessarily hear about that but it really just speaks to the, the quality of, of students we have. Our, our athletes um, really are, are succeeding on the field, um, in the gym, in the pool, um, but we're even more proud of what they're doing in the community and the success that they're having as student athletes. Again, that, that we don't necessarily see lauded um, in the news or on TV, but again, just speaks to, to the quality of students that we've um, been honored to be able to attract to Howard and, and support them in developing themselves, not just as athletes and, and not just as um, students, but also in terms of the, the commitment that they have to the communities that, that they serve. So uh, real quick, I, I neglected the beginning to say, if you have questions, please throw them into the Q&A. But luckily, one of you has uh, been uh, intuitive enough to, to figure that out and has submitted a question. So um, do your STEM students have minors in the humanities? Uh, like how, how disciplinary is their education? And do the faculty partnerships between humanities and data science, like team teach courses, I believe is the question. Sure, that's, that, that's a great question. Our, our CAR STEM scholars, if, if you 
would see some of the things that they're they're majoring and and minoring minoring in. Uh, a number of them were in dual enrollment programs in high school, so they're coming to Howard. Many of them already with 15, 30, 60 college credits already, um, but they really push themselves. So we have you know car scholars who are are majoring in chemical engineering and minoring in art or music. Uh, or double majoring in, um, you know, political science and, and biology. I, I mean, really are um, uh, push themselves academically um, because they want to be in, in a rigorous environment. But the other thing that I've really noticed is that these, you know, aren't, you know, just the, your, your, your prototypical nerds who only want to be in, in the lab. These are really talented young people who have athletic, who have athletic, talents, a, a number of them have talents as musicians. Um, several of them, um, you know, have talents in terms of um, spoken word. Um, and so they, they do major, um, while they're majoring in, in a STEM area, many of them choose to minor in the arts or in the humanities and, and the social sciences. And, and we are fully supportive of that. We Part of our um, mission and our goal is really to develop them holistically um, and to, to give them the opportunity to be exposed to everything that Howard has to offer as an institution that Washington DC has to offer as a, a city, but really just framed around, well, the primary reason you're here uh, is to get an education, is to, to get a degree. Um, but we want them to have as full a university experience as possible. We have, with this particular program, we have over a, a 92% completion rate. Uh, so that just tells you that they are focusing <laughs> academically and, and they're going on to graduate and professional schools, but a number of them have joined fraternities and sororities. We have several that have been um, athletes on our volleyball um, and other teams, and, and again, they um, really are, are committed to, to participation and participating in terms of uh, community programs, community service activities. We have an alternative spring break that our students participate in, and, and they take full advantage of that as, as well. So they really are experiencing um, every aspect of, of university life and, and excelling. So maybe to pivot just a little bit, but maybe not too far because maybe everything you've been talking about builds into this, but one of the um, impressive numbers that Howard Forward illustrates is your enrollment, your increase in enrollments at a time when so many schools, you know, HBCUs and beyond are struggling with enrollments and struggling with um, attracting students. I mean, it, it sounds like, Part of the answer to that is, is some of what you're talking about, interdisciplinary, the student experience, but are there other pieces that you think are going into the trajectory that you see in student enrollment? Sure, yeah, I, I, I think, you know, one of the, the points you made that I'll, I'll also re reiterate is, is that we've been creating uh, a number of innovative programs um, that, that we, wanted to make sure would, would be of interest to students, would, would support them in terms of developing um, their full capabilities. Um, we've created programs, um, for example, like um, Howard West, um, which is now um, Tech Exchange, which was our partnership with, with Google, um, uh, wherein we, we sent uh, a number of computer science students uh, to be in a residential experiential environment on Google's campus in uh, Mountain View, California. And we sent a group of faculty um, with them uh, so that the students were, were taking courses um, that were taught by Howard faculty, were co-taught um, by um, Googlers um, and were engaged in really this, this holistic um, experiment. Um, it, it, it went, um, successfully to the point that we, we created a, a second program uh, we called Howard Entertainment, which was a, a partnership with Amazon Studios. And so similarly, we sent to Los Angeles, a group of um, law, business, uh, communications and fine arts students uh, to really learn more about the business aspect of the entertainment industry 
um, and, and how they could see themselves in that type of, of leadership role, again, taught by courses that were taught by Howard faculty, were co-taught um, by um, leaders in the entertainment industry supported by Amazon Studios. And we think those types of programs really creating um, innovation, giving students the, the opportunity to um, experience what it is to, to be um, in the entertainment industry, to be in um, the tech industry, and also working with those industry partners with the goal of diversifying um, those areas. Uh, you know, we absolutely um, had as one of our goals to diversify tech um, with Google as a partner to diversify the entertainment industry with Amazon Studios as a partner, looking for other industry leaders to create um, similar programs as, as well. Um, and certainly just in, in terms of, of timing, while um, our enrollment has been, been increasing really since 2017, 2018, pre-COVID, uh, having uh, Vice President Harris as an alum who's, who's a great advocate uh, for the university and, and, and really speaks to um, the types of roles that our students could aspire to certainly ha has been helpful um, as well. So having unique, innovative programs, having um, programs that, that really speak to placing students in successful environments, having outstanding alums um, that, that speak to the, the things that our students will be able to uh, accomplish and, and really trying to be thoughtful about um, what's coming next, what are the areas that we want to make sure that we're providing um, educational experiences to our students, whether it's in data science, whether it's in environmental science or policy. Uh, we're completely transforming our biomedical sciences graduate programs. Um, so just being thoughtful about um, making sure that we're creating experiences and, and creating programs um, to support the aspirations of our students and uh, to support um, the workforce. You know, what is Google looking for in, 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 in an employee? What is Amazon Studios uh, looking for? What are, you know, what are the trends in terms of, of hiring that we need to be thoughtful about? Um, as we create programs to, to educate the whole student, um, but also make sure that they will have an opportunity to be successful uh, when they leave the university. So that leads me to, to a question. Um, so we haven't exactly jumped into what Kaplan and Howard uh, does together uh, just yet. Um, but part of that, you know, when the focus of, on it being around test prep, is really preparing students for what they were going to do after their time at Howard, right? After they graduate, right? And Kim and I spend a lot of time meeting with folks in leadership and higher ed all across the country, plus Puerto Rico and Canada uh, as well. Uh, and there wow. does seem to be, yeah, a lot. Uh, there does seem to be a lot of focus everywhere on enrollment, persistence, mm -hmm. retention, graduation rate, uh, and then there can be sometimes a missing part of like, and then what do you do after you graduate, right? Mm -hmm. And so um, I was hoping you could speak to like, how does that part of like what comes after graduation fit into your strategic plan? Um, and why is that a priority versus, you know, just maybe like, just get them to graduate and then we've done our right. job. No, I, that, that, that's a great question. We, we, we know that we have a um, significant portion of our students who um, either go on to graduate or professional school um, or certainly have an interest or desire um, to do so. So one of the things that was also important for us is, is not just getting students to, to graduation, which we absolutely need to do and, and which is a priority for us, but really preparing them for their, their lives after they leave Howard. And, and if their aspiration is to go on to, to law school or to go on to pharmacy school or to medical school or uh, to some other graduate or professional program, uh, part of our responsibility is, is to make sure that we're providing all the tools 
uh, for them to be able to do that um, successfully. Uh, so, you know, as, as you mentioned at the onset, we're the um, leading institution in terms of sending African-American students to, to medical school, but we really believe that we can be even more successful uh, if we were very intentional in terms of making sure that our, our pre-med students um, have all the preparation that they need are not just doing well um, in the classroom and, and um, uh, in other areas, but that they, they also need to do, do well on the MCATs because that, that, that is you know, still a, a significant determinant um, of the medical schools, um, which students that they will admit. Um, likewise, in, in, in other graduate and professional programs, again, we want to make sure that our students in addition to doing well academically um, and getting um, their undergraduate degrees, we, we want to make sure that they're well prepared to be successful, whatever graduate or professional program they, they aspire to, um, that they will have that opportunity to be, be considered highly as, as an applicant. And, and certainly for our students who will go directly to, to the workforce, um, after to, um, graduation, again, we, we, we want to make sure that we're creating as many opportunities um, for them to be successful, for them to consider not just what am I going to do after graduation, but five years after graduation, where do I want to be? Ten years after graduation, where do I want to be? And what sorts of things can I do now, whether those are internships or uh, certifications, um, what types of things we can do to help make sure that they're as prepared as possible um, for the career success that they may be envisioning for themselves. And real, real, sorry, Kim, one more quick follow-up on that. Do you find that that uh, focus and investment on sort of like what comes after graduation, does that sort of like have any ROI or impact on the earlier stages, right? On the recruiting, the enrollment, uh, the retention, persistence, and graduation. Does like having that strong on the back end lead to strength on the front end, I guess is how I would frame it. Sure, and, and, and I'll, I'll use again our, our CAR STEM Scholars Program as, as an example. If you think about it, our, we're, we're recruiting students into the program at 17 or 18 who are saying, I know I want to earn a PhD. You know, I've, I, that wasn't me at 16 or 17. <laughs> and I didn't know that, I mean, I, I, I kind of thought I wanted to go to professional school, um, but for, for a student, a young person that age, who has that, is prepared to make that type of commitment and, and we've been able to help support them um, in that, you know, one of the things that really surprised us that the first year we started the program, um, we, th without any advertising, we had just hired uh, our outstanding um, inaugural program director, Ron Smith, uh, and we were surprised there were over 400 young people who applied. Mm -hmm. um, and so the, the first weekend where we, we interviewed um, students, we had invited close to 100 students to interview, and, and they came, and it, it just surprised us that um, there were that many student, young people who were prepared to make this type of commitment. We've been so pleased really with the success of that program that we've created a um, companion program. Um, and so this fall, we are also um, admitting young people into a program um, where they would commit to pursuing a PhD in a humanity or social sciences field. And we actually had more young people apply to that program <laughs> than we did uh, the KOSH program. So again, um, the, the, the type of, of young person at 17, 18, who is preparing to commit to pursuing a PhD in, in English or in sociology or in some other humanities or social science field is just, uh, is phenomenal. And, and it really exceeded our expectations. And we're, we're looking forward to the successes that those students will also um, have. So we have some questions before we before we get into those questions. I, I did just want to take a minute to talk about how we know each other, how we work together, right? Um, because I think it does in in thinking about what you've talked about, our partnership, also how it 
it supports across campus, across schools. Um, it supports efficiencies. Obviously, it, it supports um, academic success and, and what we were just talking about in terms of students going on um, to school. And, and so our partnership is around all access, which um, just to give a little bit of a definition around all access. So um, Kaplan works with different universities, Howard being one of them, an important one of them, <laughs> um, where there's a flat fee and school, the school, the university can pick from various courses to support their goals. And so licensure, test prep, credentials, which are the different resources you all chose to support school your students with. Um, I just, I'd love to just, um, if you could talk for a couple minutes about why all access was an important investment on Howard's end and, and to just highlight that um, Howard, not it doesn't just support undergraduate students. You've chosen to support medical students and law students right. and pretty much across the board. So I'd love if you could just talk for a couple of minutes about that. Sure, we, we've had a, um, a longstanding relationship with, with Kaplan and you know, our law school and, and several of our other programs have been, been taking advantage of uh, the opportunities that you offered. And, and when it was sort of raised to us, do, do we want to consider this, this all access option? I, I reached out to um, all of our deans and, and asked them, is this something that, that we would find um, of value. And it was a rhetorical question, but, but the response was overwhelmingly, absolutely. And so our, our nursing uh, program, our, our school of education, um, you know, across the university, our deans indicated that this would bring significant value uh, to our students. And, you know, one of the things that we, we have also been mindful of is, is just the cost of education, trying to, to make sure we keep it affordable. And, and we serve a number of students who come from um, low socioeconomic um, backgrounds. And so, you know, when we think about um, if we can remove the cost of test prep uh, from a student who, who really, it would be a potential barrier to them, it really just opens up and, and, and creates more access, um, you know? And so, you know, this was a, a no brainer for us that if, if we could um, at, at a reasonable price point, uh, create the opportunity for students across the university, our uh, undergraduate students, students in professional programs to be able to, to benefit um, from this, this, this program and, and do it in such a way that it, it not only removes cost as, as an obstacle, um, but, but creates additional incentives for students to be able to prepare to be successful. You know, as I said, it, it was a no brainer for us to, 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 to really take advantage of it so that we could pass that opportunity on to our students. I, I mean, I think at one point we had 27 different contracts with various departments and schools. And, and so the fact that we could bring it all together. And, um, you know, I know Stephen Graham was your CFO was part of the conversation at one point. Um, so the operational efficiencies right. that we gain that you gained from from moving to all access as well as being the obvious support for students. Um, that seemed to be a big win as well. No, absolutely. And, you know, when I, I mentioned it to to Stephen, um, he was very much in support, one, because of the, the efficiencies uh, that it would bring and, and, and really to have, um, to, to decrease the amount of paperwork um, that is necessary as we, we enter into these uh, agreements and, and really to, 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 to move the cost. Um, so we, what we've done for our deans and for our schools and colleges is really um, for the cost coming from their individual budgets in, in, in several different schools and colleges, we've centralized it um, again to make it more e efficient and to um, help in terms of the value proposition uh, from the dean's perspective and, and also the benefit that our students will see. So in, in a number of ways, it was 
not just beneficial to our students, which was the primary uh, goal, but supported the university in our efforts to be more efficient uh, in our administrative processes as well. Great. Mark, should we jump into some of these questions? Yeah, absolutely. Let's do it. We don't want to fall behind. So if anyone else has any additional questions, uh, please go ahead and uh, share them in the in the Q&A. Um, so you mentioned a little bit about some of your students being very engaged in the community. Um, how do you motivate and incentivize students to engage in their community? Well, I've, I've you know, uh, I don't I, I wouldn't frame it as you know the things that we do I think we we attract um, students who overwhelmingly have a desire to contribute to to the community and 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 to engage in um, social consciousness efforts just as an example um, one of the things we do during our freshman orientation is we have a, a day of, of service um, where the the freshmen you know there are a number of projects that we um, engage in across DC and we just leave it available for, for students to, to volunteer. We've had between 1,500 to 2,000 <laughs> freshmen wow. um, each year over the last several years just volunteer. You know, we want to, and, and they may not even know what the specific <laughs> project is. They just want to, to be a part of something that is going to, to contribute in some significant way. So I, I, I think the, the young people um, in general, but, but particularly young people who um, are attracted to Howard have a sense of commitment and, and, and have a, a, a sense of wanting to contribute to something larger. So I see part of our responsibility as making those opportunities available to them, um, helping provide them with, with tools, whether it is um, programming that is is being supported by uh, our Office of Student Affairs programming that we're doing in partnership um, from the academic side. Um, our athletes are, are, as I mentioned, engaged in a number of um, programs or activities and also really building that into our academic programs. Again, I, I think regardless of, of whether a student is in engineering or is in our medical school or is in you know our nursing or allied health, you will always find some aspect of social justice and, and some aspect of, of of really consciousness in their educational um, program. And, and and you know if we didn't do it, uh, students would demand it. <laughs> so really really making sure and, and that's a commitment um, from our faculty. I, I believe we have um, some of the most engaged and, and committed faculty and staff um, as well. And, and this is something that they bring to the classroom that the students are, are really clamoring for and, and want to uh, participate in and, and have a, a way to be able to, to direct that interest um, either in an academic way or in a way that is directly related to um, community service or um, maybe you know through one of their their clubs or organizations and so i think it, it, it's something that um was already inherent in our students and 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 we just try to create additional mechanisms and opportunities for them to be able to build upon that i'll i'll, I'll use our alternative spring break uh as an example i know you're you're in new orleans uh mark um and, and you i don't know if you were there uh, around the time of of katrina Oh, yes. uh, but but shortly following Katrina, we had a group of students um, who were just so moved by what they saw on TV and, and the news. Um, they wanted to to commit their spring break not to going to Cancun or to going to one of the beaches in Florida. They wanted to contribute their uh, spring break going to New Orleans and and helping to rebuild and make a difference. And that really was the start of our alternative spring break. Um, and so it's it's run by students. It's it's supported and organized in in the office of the chapel. Um, but over time, students this past spring break went to I think 28 different cities around the country, including Flint, Michigan, um, New Orleans, um, Baltimore, Washington, 
Uh, they also included the, um, the group that went to um, Ghana for the first time and, and supported the, um, uh, a number of activities in Ghana. And this is student run, the students fundraise for it, the students organize and decide who is going to go uh, to what sites. And, and so again, it's, you know, we just provide some of the administrative infrastructure uh, to help facilitate that, but that is entirely student run and I think is, is really representative um, of the things that our students are interested in in, in making um, a contribution and in, 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 in making an impact, um, whether it's in their home community or a community um, that needs their, their services and, and it's something that um, you know we, we are very proud of. So there's a question about assisting students when it comes to balancing academics and mental health. And I know, you know, mental health is having teenagers and the mental health is a big concern. Yeah. Uh, do you feel like, well, or what kind of support do you provide? But it also sounds like this um, focus on community and focus on giving back potentially help students balance that stress and kind of the internal angst versus how you manage that you know in life when you're when you're actually committing to other people you know outside of what you're doing academically that you know that's that's a great question I, I just have to, to share with you that you know in my conversations with other academic leaders around the country, um, mental health is probably the number one concern. Um, it was already a, a concern before COVID and then you compound um, the issues with the pandemic, with the, the social justice uh, protests, with the concerns regarding our democracy. Um, it really has been a, a stressful time uh, for our students. We're, we're doing a, a number of things. Um, our Office of Student Affairs has um, oversees our counseling uh, program. We've expanded um, hiring. We, we have a, a 24 hour uh, helpline as well. We're, we're doing things in terms of using technology, uh, but it, 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 it's never enough. I, I mean, we, we, we are always constantly thinking about how we can do more, um, what additional services we, we can provide. And, you know, I'm, 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 I'm frankly concerned, um, you know, again, just given all of the stresses that our students have experienced and, and the current group um, were directly impacted by COVID. Um, my daughter is, is a graduating senior um, this year. She's finishing uh, a little bit early, but she, finished her, her high school senior year online. Uh, she didn't get to experience a prom. She didn't get to do a senior trip. Um, and then she started her freshman year online. And, and she was looking forward to being on campus, interacting with, with other students. So it, it, it has had a real impact on our students. But, but the other thing that I also want to make sure that we don't forget is, is the impact that it has had on our faculty and staff. Um, we, I literally, um, the last thing I was doing before I joined the webinar is where we're sending out a communication to our faculty and staff in terms of mental health awareness, um, both in terms of their own personal mental health and, and what to do if you observe a student who may um, um, be, be showing signs of, of concern and, and, and you know, what are the outlets and, and the services available to, to help support those students um, and to support yourself. Um, I think one of the things that we um, really haven't paid as much attention to as we should is, is how much the pandemic in the last three years has impacted each of us individually and, and things that we need to do to one, be conscious about it, be open and willing to, to seek help um, and support and, and to have a support system. Um, and I, I think that is both on a personal level, but also on an institutional level, what we're doing as um, an institution, as a community to support our faculty, students and staff, and how do we take advantage of, of resources to make them as available and, and as commonplace as, as possible. I think that's such a great point. Mm -hmm. Because I think 
you know, it seemed like such a surreal experience going through COVID. Most are, people aren't wearing masks anymore. It's not the, the height of the pandemic, but you're right. It's, it will continue to, what happened in those months and years will continue to affect how, how we all interact with each other, interact as, as communities. It, it's a really well-made point. Um, it's, it's not going away. <laughs> yeah. So real quick, we do have a few questions and it, I, based on how things are going, I don't think we're gonna get to every question to be able to answer it live here on camera. And just, just so you know, if we don't get to your question, we will endeavor to follow up uh, with an answer uh, via email afterwards. Um, uh, but Dr. Wooten, I did want to ask you um, something else regarding um, your adoption of All Access with Kaplan, which Kim knows I've been lobbying that we should change the name to Inclusive Access because it's <laughs> inclusive for all the students that really like levels the playing field. Um, but in our conversations that we have with many institutions, nearly everyone, as your internal polling goes, when you ask your deans, hey, would it be good if we had this? Mm -hmm. Like literally universally, everyone says yes, right? Uh, but one of the questions or obstacles or challenges that comes up is that, yes, but we, did, we haven't budgeted for that, right? Mm -hmm. And so whenever we talk about this adoption of this access to test prep for all students across a campus, that's one of the main questions that comes up. And so that's what I want to ask you. Um, you're shifting the responsibility for paying for this test prep, you know, both from the individual students, right? And in your case, from, you know, your different colleges and departments that may have been doing things to support students already. How, how did Howard uh, pay for this? Like where, where, where did that come from and how did that work on your end? Sure, no, that, that's a great question. And, you know, for us, um, as, as Kim had mentioned, we, we were already, um, partnering with, with Kaplan in a number of um, schools and, and, and programs, our law school, uh, I had mentioned. And we also knew that we had a number of, of undergraduate students who were doing test prep, or at least were looking uh, for access to, to, to test prep. So, uh, you know, being a good CFO, our CFO actually did an analysis and, and he looked at what we were paying um, across our various individual contracts, the, the number of additional students who would potentially be, be serviced. And a large part of the, the cost for the all access contract really would, would substitute for what we all were already paying um, for the individual agreements. And again, we, we did an analysis sort of considering how many additional students could potentially be served and, and, and we felt that from a uh, cost benefit um, perspective that it, it would certainly be well worth um, our resources to be able to, to enter into the agreement. But, but to answer the, 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 the primary question, um, if we hadn't entered into you know, this all access, uh, a significant amount of, of funds would have been going towards supporting the, the individual school and college um, contracts. So, so for, you know, for us, it wasn't necessarily an entirely new expense as much as it was consolidating um, you know, individual agreements that we had in place and, and being more efficient um, in, in that and also providing access um, to students who wanted to access the services, but for whom individual costs would have been um, an inhibitor. Thank you. Uh, Kim, for the last uh, few minutes here, do we wanna go uh, through Q and A and try to get to as many as we can? Yeah, let's do it. Um, so just since we were talking about COVID a minute ago, um, one of the questions is how did Howard adjust their GE, their general ed requirements to support students regardless of majors and in wake of COVID? Um, that's, that's an interesting question. We, we actually are in the um, final stages of a significant general education reform. Uh, it wasn't necessarily um, because of COVID. I think we had actually started 
the process prior to COVID, but but we wanted we we've, we've been looking um, at our general education requirements and and wanted to um, one make sure that they were were contemporary, and and that we were um, creating a a process to to assure that. Uh, there was more continuity across campus. One of the things that um, we had observed is that there, there were very different requirements depending on whether a student was in the College of Arts and Sciences or if they were in the School of Business or they were in our School of Communication. So we wanted to have a baseline, um, more consistent um, list of general education requirements. The other thing we, we wanted to do is we wanted to give students more of an opportunity to get credit for experiential learning. So for students who would volunteer to participate in alternative spring break for a week, as an example, we thought it would be important that they be able to get credit for that and, and that it would count towards some general education um, efforts. And, and the other thing was we, we wanted to, to also allow more flexibility in, in our majors. Um, and so decreasing the, the general education requirements, making them more contemporary, um, also allowed for you know, our majors who decide, well, we really, um, given changes in our discipline, believe a student should take this additional credit uh, for this major and, and, and making the adjustments in general education. Um, and so we're, we're just at the point of, you know, ideally implementing that um, for the fall. Um, and so we, we were already in, in the process of um, revising our general education requirements and then COVID just happened to, to, to happen on top of that. So we have just a couple minutes left and, and we do have a lot of questions that as Mark mentioned, we will answer, send out. But I, I would like to just take a couple of minutes to have you Kind of think about. Um, I know Howard Forward is through twenty four. Is that right? Yes. Um, so if you had to think about the next five years, over the next three to five years, um, what do you think the biggest challenges or and or opportunities for 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 Howard in order to deliver, continuing to deliver on student success? You know, maybe it's the challenge, what, what, what would you see as the biggest challenge, challenges? Well, I think in, in, in terms of our academic um, programs is, is really looking at the curriculum in, in each of our programs, um, in some cases, revising them, um, making sure that they are uh, contemporary and, and meeting the needs of our students, I think, we also have an increasing number of, of students who want flexibility, um, who want to combine this program and, and that program or to do multiple things and, 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 and have more um, uh, opportunity to, to do things that, that may be unique uh, to, to their areas of interest. So, so being uh, a little bit more flexible while we're also uh, being interdisciplinary where we're actually engaging in, in, in probably the most significant um, building and, and renovation um, process uh, in the history of the university where we're investing um, over $750 million in, in new and renovated academic buildings over the next three to five years. So making sure that we, we can do that um, successfully, that we, 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 we are creating new academic space uh, that we're, we're creating um, additional housing uh, for students. And so while our enrollment um, has been increasing, it, it's also creating pressures <laughs> and, and other ways that, that we just need to make sure that we're um, on top of and that we're addressing uh, as we continue to meet the needs of our current students and plan for uh, what our future students will be looking for and expecting in their experience. Well, thank you so much, um, Provost Wu Toad, for spending the time with us. Um, I, I am such a fan of Howard and, and yourself and everything that you're accomplishing. So um, thank you for taking the time um, in your very busy schedule for chatting with us and, and letting us learn more about everything you're doing at Howard and, of course, talking about our partnership, which um, 
you know, we, we are really proud to be working with you all. Oh, thank you. It's certainly been my, my pleasure as, as well. We certainly look forward to continue to, to partner uh, to benefit our students and, and help make sure that they can achieve all of their career goals and aspirations as well. So thank you. You're welcome. And, and thanks to all of you for joining. And thank you to uh, Inside Higher Ed for hosting uh, and appreciate uh, everyone's participation. Thank you. Thank you.